My dad has always taught me to work hard, be a leader and example, and to stand up for myself when I need to. The best thing that I learned from my dad is to make sure to tell my kids that I love them. One thing I learned from my dad was commitment. He was always committed to reading God's word. I saw him in his word every day, and he was always committed to his job to work hard to provide for his family. So some wisdom that I received from my dad is how important it is for you to keep your word, that your word is your bond. Don't ever make a promise that you don't intend on keeping. And I've tried to convey this message to my sons as well. I'll never forget my dad always just saying like, hey, when, when life knocks you down, you gotta get back up. My, my dad taught me to persevere through difficult times. And I really appreciate that about my dad. The biggest thing I've learned from my dad is the importance of loyalty. He has always been a loyal employee, a loyal husband, and a loyal father to me and my sister. And it's really just taught me what it looks like to place others above ourselves. My dad used to say that he's forgotten more than I'll ever know. And that anytime I got injured, it'll feel better when it stops hurting. Some life lessons that I've learned from my dad is that meat should always be prepared extra, extra, extra well done. That TPing houses is meant for not enemies, but friends. Tabasco sauce is good on everything. And boys are bad, except for dad. I'm thankful for my dad for teaching me how to treat people with respect, have joy in my life, and how to love others uh, every day, no matter what's going on in my life. Oh, I, I like boys are bad except for dad. I'm going to go with that from now on, you know, with my daughters. But uh, hey, to all you dads out there, we just want to say we love you. We honor you. We want you to feel inspired at this church to be all that God has made you to be. And we just have an incredible treat this weekend. Uh, Dr. Rick Rigsby is with us as a guest speaker. Um, he is a pastor who for almost two decades was also a professor, most of that time at Texas A&M, where he was also the chaplain for the Aggies football team, if there's any Aggies fans in the house on any of our campuses this weekend. But um, right now, he's the president and CEO of Rick Rigsby Communications. He's spoken to Fortune 500 companies, the NFL, the PGA, and I'm just telling you what the message he's going to give today, I heard him give back in 2017, and when I heard it, I just knew we had to get him to come to CCV, and I, I promise you there won't be anyone here today that walks away um, the same. You're going to be challenged to be all that God wants you to be, and so without further ado, would you help me give a huge CCV welcome to Dr. Rick Rigsby. What's up, CCV? How y'all doing? Well, I'm so glad to be here today, and to all the campuses that are streaming in, I am so glad that you're joining us, and I am so excited to be here. Couldn't wait to get to this wonderful, wonderful church, and I better get started right away because uh, I come from a predominantly black family. I don't know if y'all can tell that or not. And I'm an ordained minister, I'm a pastor. That is a lethal combination when it comes to time. You give me some chicken wings, I'll talk to you all day long. But in the words of King Henry VIII, as he spoke to each of his six wives, I won't keep you long. But I have a message designed for everybody, particularly the men. And I wanna really take advantage of the time that we have together. And so I wish that you would turn to a very familiar passage that serves as the scriptural setting for our time this afternoon. It is Deuteronomy chapter number six. Deuteronomy chapter number six, verses four through nine. If you don't have your Bibles or your smartphones, I believe they're going to put it on the screen for you right now. This is a really important passage. It is wise counsel to people who are making a transition, a major transition from Moab into the promised land. God, as you know, instructs Moses to tell my people, don't forget that you are children of God. Even though you're living, about to cross into a corrupt, sinless, vile land, remember 
remember that you're my children. Deuteronomy chapter number six, beginning with verse number four. Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord is one. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. Some of your translations say strength. And these words today which I am commanding you shall be on your heart. And you shall teach them diligently to your sons. And shall talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way. And when you lie down and when you rise up. And you shall bind them as a sign on your hand. And they shall be as frontals on your forehead. And you shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. This is incredibly important counsel. It was very important counsel back then as the children of Israel had just spent 40 years walking in the wilderness, circling because of a lack of obedience as a result of a lack of trust. Anytime there's a lack of trust in our lives, we're going to find ourselves wasting time walking in circles, flunking the same grades over and over and over again. Amen? Y'all going to have to make some noise. I said amen. amen. Are you listening? Say I'm listening. As a former college professor, let me share something with you. 50% of what you hear, you forget just like that. Of the remaining 50%, you lose 38% over the next 24 hours. I need you to say amen. amen. I need you to make some noise. Much better. Listen, I preach in, I know this isn't a white church, but I preach in some white churches. I get so bored, I put myself to sleep. Y'all don't hear what I'm saying. And so Moses is saying, I'm delivering God's word. You're about to go into Canaan. Don't forget your distinctive. Make sure that you honor God in every single thing you do. Listen and obey. Make sure you listen and obey. What is the very first thing that God tells Moses to say to the children of Israel? Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord is one. Why would God say that? He's saying that because they're about to go into an idolatrous society, a culture that practices multi-gods and worshiping multi-gods. It's called polytheism. God wants to remind his people there is one true and living God, amen? amen. And it's so very important that when you get caught up in a world, that thinks that there are a variety of ways to heaven, sound familiar? That th where sin abounds, sound familiar? Where we're worshiping everything except the one true living God, sound familiar? That he might cause us to say, don't forget me. Remember, remember that I am the one and true living God. And then he says these words, love me with everything you've got. Boy, it's rare to find a person that loves God these days with all their heart with all their soul and with all their might. You know what that means? That means that every waking moment you're thinking, how can God in my life be dominant, prominent, preeminent, zenith, number one, top drawer, top shelf, central core? In my, how can I love people without expecting to be loved in return? How many married folks here say amen? amen. How many happily married folks in here say amen? amen. I like that, y'all. Here's the way you stay happy. Start preferring that other person over yourself. That's loving with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. Prefer others. Prefer others. That's thinking about God so intensely that God is the motivation for everything you do, that God is to be glorified in every word and in every deed, loving others without expecting to be loved in return. I love Tozer's words. Tozer said, what comes to mind, A.W. Tozer? What comes to mind? when you think of God, and whatever it is that comes to mind when you think of God, that is your most important thought of that day. I wanna love you, God, so profoundly that I lose myself. I wanna love you, God, in such a drastic way that I think of myself last. I wanna love you, God, so much that even if somebody cuts me off on the freeway, I don't cuss them out. I wanna love you, God, in such a profound way that if somebody lies on me or if somebody insults me, I will be like a sheep being led to slaughter and keep my mouth closed. Come on, somebody. I'm talking about loving God. God, I want to love you so much that I, I don't care who they vote for for president. I'll still love them. <laughs> Father, help me to love Republicans. Help me love Democrats. Help me love everybody. Christ belongs to the whole world. God is saying right now, church, 
We're going through a season of transition. Wake up. We're going through a season of transition. Don't play church. Don't come to church and that's all you're gonna do is come sit and get happy and get fat. The Bible says go, make, baptize, and teach. And he's calling us right now with wise counsel saying, don't forget your distinctive. We are in some of the worst times in the history of the United States with unrest and division all over the world, especially in the United States of America, where every week it seems as though there's another school shooting, where every week it seems as though there's another bloodbath at work, where every week it seems as though wrong is being turned to make look right. We are entering a critical time where it's getting darker and darker, but how many of you know Isaiah says the darker the day, the brighter the potential for the light to shine. Come on, somebody. God wants us. God wants us to remember, remember that he is God, that he is the Lord, and that we are to love people who don't look like us, who don't act like us, who don't smell like us, who don't think like us, who don't vote like us. He wants us to love people with everything we've got. I wanna tell you something. When you start loving people like that, there won't be any lukewarm Christians in this house. Not talking to you, I'm talking maybe to somebody you know. <laughs> Jesus could tolerate a whole lot of folks in the, old, in the New Testament, but one group of folks he could not tolerate, hypocrites. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. You tied dent and mill and cumin, yet, yet you've neglected the weight of your provisions of the law. You're like whitewashed tombs. On the outside, you appear beautiful, but inside, you're full of robbery and self-indulgence. First clean the inside of the cup so that the outside will appear clean as well. How many of you know that at least in the United States of America, we are practicing a type of Christianity that reflects the outside of the cup? I'm so grateful for your pastor's heart and so grateful for the people here because your pastor gets it. And I bet y'all get it. But we have to do more than just get it. We've got to go out of these doors and live it. Come on, somebody. It's, it's not about looking nice is important, but it's not about our wardrobe, amen? Come on, come on. Don't go Lutheran on me. Stay with me. <laughs> Nothing against Lutheran's great tater tot casserole, whatever that is. It's not about styling and profiling. Our value does not come from where we live. It doesn't come from the car we drive. I got friends in Dallas drive Land Rovers. They ain't even got no land. The point that I'm trying to make <laughs> is that our identity comes from J-E-S-U-S. -S. Amen? Yeah. And when we love, when we love like nobody's business, our bodies, our lives, our words, our deeds, represent a window for which the world can see Jesus. Love with all your heart, but don't only do that, model it. Everybody say model it. Model. Harvard Business Review, September 2004. The article is titled Deep Smarts. Here's the thesis. Lecturing what your universities are based upon. Worst kind of teaching method. If you want to get the intended message across, model the behavior, I want to ask you, what are you modeling? In a shallow, superficial society, we model the wrong kinds of stuff. And God is calling us to model more than just a blow-dried smile, to model more than just the latest outfit, to model more than just what our personality is all about or, 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 or what our status represents or what our business cards say. No longer are we to appease the sensibilities of folks we don't even know for the sake of impressing folks. God is calling us. He's calling us to love, even if we don't get loved in return, to model it in our homes and then to go out into the neighborhood. He said, stamp it on your hands. Put it on the frontals of your forehead. In other words, how many of you know what John 114 says? Don't turn there, just nod. Just nod like you know. Come on, nod, lady, like you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> and the word became flesh and blood and dwelt among us, Eugene Peterson in the message puts it like this, and the word became flesh and moved into the neighborhood. <laughs> God 
is calling us to move into the neighborhood, to give people the hope of Jesus, not our latest smile. <laughs> God is calling us. Stop styling and profiling. Stop laughing where it's not funny and scratching where it doesn't itch. The world is dying and they need what we have. The issue is, are you willing during this time of transition to listen and obey? Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. Teach your children and grandchildren. Then model it. Somebody say amen. amen. Somebody say amen. amen. My model was the unlikeliest of models. The wisest man I ever met in my life. A third grade dropout. That's kind of oxymoronic, isn't it? Wisest and dropout. Oxymoronic like jumbo shrimp. Oxymoronic like fun run. Ain't nothing fun about it, right? <laughs> Let me give you one more chance. Oxymoronic like Microsoft works. Y'all don't hear what I'm saying. <laughs> Oxymoronic like country music. Come on. <laughs> Didn't like that one, did you? <laughs> in fact, I've lived in Texas so long, I, I like country music now, y'all. I, I hunt. I fish. I've got cowboy boots, cowboy hats. For years, I drove a pickup truck, y'all. I'm a black neck redneck. Do you hear what I'm saying? <laughs> Wisest man I ever met in my life, a third grade dropout daddy. Left school in the third grade to help out on the family farm. But just because he left school doesn't mean his education stopped. Mark Twain once said, I've never allowed my schooling to get in the way of my education. Thank you, baby. <laughs> father taught himself how to read, taught himself how to write. In fact, one of the first lessons my father taught me, everybody say, I'm listening. I can't hear you. Everybody say, I'm listening. <laughs> Son, yes, daddy, don't expect other people to do for you what you ought to do for yourself. His lessons and my mother's lessons came right out the Bible. Father taught me to love people without expecting to be loved in return. Watch this. Watch this. My father decides in the midst of Jim Crowism, as America is breathing the last gasp of the Civil War, my daddy decides in rural Texas he's gonna stand and be a man. How many of you know you can get lynched if you have the wrong color skin for taking a stand like that? My father decided he was gonna stand and be a man. Not a black man, not a brown man, not a white man, but a man. Let me tell you something. When you stand for God, when you love people who you know hate you, oh, I feel like preaching. When you love people, when you love people that have lied on you, when you love people that have done you wrong, I'm talking about them folks that you call family members at the family reunion. Y'all know what I'm talking about? You know the one, and every family's got one of those relatives. When you love people like that, guess what will happen? You will grow a kind of godly impact that will remain far after you're gone. My father was born in 1920. He was standing in the 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, 1972. I'm 63 today, so in 1972, I'm 16. I got an afro so big I can't get in the Volkswagen. <laughs> Lady, I still can't get in the Volkswagen. <laughs> push, push. I'm working at Jack in the Box. They have Jack in the Box in Arizona? I'm embarrassed to tell you the next part. I come home one day. My father said, son, what's wrong with you? I said, uh, that white man over there told me I had to scrub toilets. Daddy, I don't scrub nobody's toilet. I fry french fries. <laughs> 16, did I mention that? My father said, son, what does the color of your skin have to do with you displaying excellence? And right then I could tell this conversation was not gonna go the way I thought it was gonna go. <laughs> it got worse. Who's your supervisor, I told him. He said, son, as long as that person is signing your check, you do whatever that person tells you to do. Now when you own your own restaurant, you do whatever you wanna do. But this is what your daddy wants you to do today. I'm talking about the legacy of a godly father. Go back to Jack in the Box. Don't drive over there, leave your car in the driveway. 
Walk back to Jack in the Box. Tell your boss that your daddy said you want to volunteer for an eight-hour shift and all you want to do is scrub toilets and gutters. <laughs> What's my point? If you're a woman making a godly impact, if you're a man making a godly impact, if you're a young person making a godly impact, and you make that impact every single day, every single month, every single year, that impact will remain far after you're gone. My father's been gone a number of years. The impact continues to this day. I have four boys. The youngest is 18. Several months ago, I made the mistake of going into his bathroom. I said, son, come here and look at this toilet. Daddy needs you to scrub this toilet. I need you to scrub it with excellence. You're not going to believe what that boy said to me. How much do I get paid? I said, you get one more day on God's green earth. That's how much you get paid. <laughs> Pastor Rick, why are you so hard on your son? I'm not hard on him. My daddy placed a demand upon me. Listen to me. Listen to me, parents. My dad placed a demand on me that goes beyond the chains and shackles of blaming others and making excuses. Come on, somebody. He, he, he said, you be excellent no matter what. Guess what else I know? All the ladies in here say, hey. hey. This is what I know, ladies. If I don't place a demand of excellence on that 18-year-old at 28, I'm going to have to apologize to his wife for giving her a boy and not a man. I'm talking about making an impact. An impact. An impact. Third grade dropout, living Deuteronomy chapter number six. He goes away to World War II. After World War II, he comes back to Texas, tells his family he's moving to a foreign country, San Francisco. Within the, <laughs> any Californians here? What's up, y'all? Glad you made it to God's country. I love this place. This is nice here. Folks are friendly here. Somebody smile at you in San Francisco, run. Just run. First week my father's there, he falls in love with a forklift driver. My mother was a bad mamma jamma, let me tell you right now. For those of you that may not remember in high school, we had that day or two where we learned about World War history. And you'll recall, that during World War times, women would hold jobs traditionally held by men. My mother drove a forklift at an arsenal that supplied the weaponry that supported the war. They fall in love and get married. I'm the oldest of the lot. My daddy gets a job as a simple cook at a place called California Maritime Academy. We have a lot of these maritime academies throughout the country. He's a cook. He's on the support staff for a college that in order to graduate, the men and women have to go to sea three months out of every year. In a 30-year career at California Maritime Academy, this third grade dropout sails the world 10 times over, learns portions of five foreign languages. I have four degrees. My brother is a presidential appointed judge in Washington, D.C., retired colonel, United States Army. We're not the smartest ones in our family. God can do anything. God can make up for a lack of education. How many of you know that? God can make up for a lack of experience. How many of you know that? One revelatory moment with God is better than an advanced degree from Harvard. Come on, somebody. My mother used to quote Henry Ford. Ricky, if you think you can or if you think you can't, you're right. And his third grade dropout daddy, quoting Michelangelo so many times I'd get sick. Now it brings tears to my eyes. Ricky? Yes, Daddy? I'm not going to have a problem, Ricky, if you aim high and miss, but I'm going to have a real issue if you aim low and hit. Third grade dropout Daddy, teaching me lessons like, son, don't judge people. Don't judge. Evaluate? Absolutely. Judge never. Son, I've been all over the world. I've seen good and bad in every shade. The problem is, when we judge people, it puts us in a position of authority. And, and, and that position is oftentimes self-elevating. And you begin to perceive incorrectly that other person. And how can you impact somebody that you've already judged? And then he dropped Jonathan Swift on me, who said on one occasion, vision is the ability to see the invisible. Everybody say, don't judge. <laughs> what would our country look like if we evaluated but not judge? Son? Yes, Daddy? No one is beneath you. 
No one. Boy, does that sound like Jesus. I said, does that sound like loving somebody with all their heart, with all their soul, and all their might? Come on, y'all. Don't judge. Don't judge. Everybody say, don't judge. <laughs> if all you see is what you see, you don't see all there is that needs to be seen. I wish I had some time. I wish I had some time to talk to y'all. I wish I had some time to tell you about a third grade teacher. I wish I had time to tell you about Mrs. Heyman. The fact that I'm sharing this story 55 years later ought to tell you something. I had the propensity for talking in class. Shouldn't come as a surprise. Mrs. Heyman said, stay after school. I knew what that meant. That meant I had to write a thousand times on the blackboard, I will not talk in class. Mrs. Heyman met me with a book after class. Mrs. Heyman said, Ricky, it's obvious you have a gift, and Mrs. Heyman's gonna teach you when it's appropriate to exercise that gift. Grace. And then she handed me a copy of a Beverly Clary book called Henry and the Paper Route. And I immediately became mesmerized by Henry Huggins and his friends Beezus and Ramona and the dog Ribsy. What's your, what's your point, Rick? Because a woman who had never been on the front page of the paper, come on, who, who had never been on NPR, today our guest is Mrs. Who had never had any kind of publicity because she didn't judge what she saw. She planted some seeds that today have blossomed. Because of those seeds, I have a vociferous appetite for knowledge and an efficacious vocabulary. Don't judge. Don't judge. Don't judge people. Everybody say don't judge. Listen to these basics. Son, be an hour early. Son, you'd rather be an hour early than a minute late. Uh, you've lost me there, Rick. What, what about traffic just getting in here? Leave the night before. My father had the breakfast and lunch shift. He had to be at California Maritime Academy at five o'clock in the morning. The academy was just 15 minutes from our home. My mother said for 30 years, he left at 345. She said, why, daddy? Answer, one of these days, one of my boys will be up and catch me in the act of excellence. Aristotle put it this way, you are what you repeatedly do. Therefore, excellence ought to be a habit, not an act. Everybody say early. You know what I'm teaching you? I'm teaching you biblical principles designed to get you to love the way that Christ loved, designed to get you to think about what God was saying when he talked to Moses that will cause you to make an impact. If you're a godly man, start acting like a godly man. What, what good is it to call yourself a Christian and act like hell Monday through Friday? You can call yourself a Christian all you want, but when you show up late, you've just nullified your Christianity. When you judge 18 out of 20 coworkers, end of your Christianity. Y'all don't like me anymore, do you? Everybody say, don't judge. Everybody say, early. Son, be kind. Everybody say, kindness. When I was a kid, we had a word called manners. Anybody remember that word? Kindness was a value. Today, kindness is a commodity that we barter to get what we think we might need to appease the sensibilities of folks we don't even know. My daddy said, son, be kind. Huh? What did you just say, Mother Teresa? Be, be kind to folks, even if they're not kind to you. That's our Jesus. That's loving people with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. Everybody say kindness. kindness. How about this one? Son? Yes, daddy? Make sure your servant's towel is bigger than your ego. Ego is the anesthesia that deadens the pain of stupidity. <laughs> Pride is the burden of a foolish person. Son, make sure your servant's towel is always on display. Why, Daddy? It will remove the chains and shackles from your own sense of self-importance. You can't impact somebody if it's all about you. Son, yes, Daddy, be excellent. If you're gonna do a job, do it right. For all the English teachers, I know it ought to be do it well, but I like the way my father used to say it. I'm thinking of a little boy that grew up in a little town called Lompo, California. All he wanted to do was play Little League Baseball. His mother couldn't even afford to buy him a glove. He goes into the cupboard and gets a paper bag and turns it into a glove. He finds a tennis ball and throws it against the back of his apartment complex, catches it with a makeshift glove. That's his Little League. Until he eventually plays, and he's good. I mean, really good at shortstop. Gets a scholarship at Cal Poly. Gets drafted by the San Diego Padres. Helps the St. Louis Cardinals win a World Series. 
When he was drafted or inducted into baseball's Hall of Fame, here's a portion of his induction speech. I'm talking about Ozzie Smith, by the way. All my life I've been told what I could not do. I decided to pursue excellence and I was guided by one motto. Good enough isn't good enough if it can be better. And better isn't good enough if it can be best. Translation, let your light shine in such a way that men will see your good works and glorify your Father who's in heaven. You. you want to make an impact? You really want to make an impact? You take this word at its word. Ask God to give you ears to hear. What does that mean? A hearing heart. And he will instruct you as we go into this transition. I really lived for myself for 40 years of my life. And I have nothing to show for it. And I had every advantage. I was one of those preachers that preached, but I didn't know God. But there was an event in my life that changed everything. It started back in the 70s. It was in the 70s when I met the finest woman I've ever met in my life. Back in my day, we'd have called her a brick. Oh, y'all know what I'm talking about. <laughs> so it's after a football game, and we're at this dance, and I find out her name is Trina, and I'm just in love. The problem is about 200 other guys were in love. So we're at this dance, and, and I'm at the snack table because she's out of my league. Come on, somebody. And all of a sudden, I hear my mother's words, if you think you can or if you think you can't, you're right. So I figured I'm dressed. I got on a leisure suit, a purple leisure suit. I have on purple platform shoes. I look like a black Barney. Do y'all hear what I'm saying to you? I walk out on the dance floor and I said, hi, my name is Ricky Rigsby. She said, my name is Trina Williams. I said, may I dance with you? She said, sure. We started dancing and I got carried away and asked her for her phone number. Do y'all know that Trina was the first one? Actually, Trina was the only woman in college who gave me her actual real telephone number. <laughs> the next day on a landline phone with a rotary dial, what came out of my mouth made one of my roommates laugh so hard he fell off the bunk bed. All I said was, Trina, will you go to Baskin and Robbins ice cream parlor and have an ice cream cone? He laughed, she said yes. We walked the six miles to Baskin and Robbins because my car was broke. We go on several more dates, we start going together. It gets so serious, I take her home to visit my parents. My daddy, he looks my hero. Looked at Trina, then he looked at me. <laughs> he actually whispered in my ear, is she psycho? Is everything going all right? <laughs> we dated all through college. I proposed and to everybody's shock, Trina said yes. I married the most beautiful woman I've ever met in my life. How many of you have ever been to a wedding, and before the wedding even starts, you hear something that sounds like this? How in the world? <laughs> and it was coming from my side of the family. <laughs> we get married. We start, our, uh, we start our, our family. Two boys. We start our careers. Life is great. Several years into our marriage, Trina finds a lump in her left breast, breast cancer. Six years after that diagnosis, me and my two little boys walk up to mommy's casket. For two years, my heart didn't beat. If it wasn't for my faith in God, I wouldn't be here today. For those of you that are going through something, I remember doing like this to God and with the other hand, holding on for dear life. Our God is so big, He's not intimidated. If it wasn't for those boys, I'd have lost my way. For 40 years, I'd made life about myself. Now I had to grow up in a hurry because those boys needed a daddy and a mama. But guess whose words on earth bless me and help me more than anybody else's? That third grade dropout daddy. One more lesson to teach me before he would die. The classroom for this lesson was a funeral home. The chalkboard was a casket, my wife's casket. And at that casket, I found my daddy crying. And he sobered up, and he said three words that changed my life. He said, son, just stand. Pastor Ashley, I don't know if I can tell your wonderful folks anything more profound than these words. Keep standing. No matter what, keep standing. I kept standing, 
And a couple of years later, my heart started to beat again. I'm speaking again. And in the middle of one particular speech, I spot the finest woman I've ever met in my life. <laughs> my friends can't believe it. Two! <laughs> First thing Janet did was she adopted my little boys, fulfilling Trina's last wish that her babies not go through life without a mommy. Then we had more kids, boys. <laughs> Chuck, show this picture. This is my family today. And I'm showing you this picture for one reason. I'm showing you this picture for one reason. I have absolutely nothing to do with this picture. This picture is courtesy of the impact of a godly man. This picture, listen to me carefully, this picture is the legacy of a godly man who placed a demand upon me during the worst days of my life to not quit. My question to you is this. What is the picture of the impact that you're making? And how will that determine your legacy? Not just to the men, but to the women as well. Every day, remind yourself, I serve the one true living God. It is my privilege to love everybody without expecting to be loved in return. It is my great honor to model it everywhere I go. That's the impact of a godly man. And if a godly man showed me what a man looks like, a dying wife taught me how to be a man. Two days before Trina died, no hair because of chemo, a tummy that pooched out because of a liver not working. She weighed 80 pounds. We realized that barring a miracle, the time of her departure had come. She's sitting on the couch surrounded by pillows. I'm in the kitchen keeping an eye on her. I notice out of the corner of my eye, our then youngest son, Andrew, walked down the stairs with his shirt. And this is what I heard next. Andrew, mama, not always gonna be here to help you. She was saying goodbye to her baby. I waited for Andrew to leave. I walked over and I sat next to Trina on the couch. And without her breathing labored at all, as clearly as I'm talking to y'all right now, these were some of my wife's last words to me. Ricky, it doesn't matter to me any longer how long I live. What matters to me most is how I live. CCV, campuses, folks streaming in everywhere. One question, how you living? How you living? How you living? Choose this day to no longer live lukewarm. I guarantee you a lukewarm Christian doesn't make a statement like that. You know who makes a statement like that? Someone who loves the Lord their God with all their heart, with all their soul, with all their might. Choose this day to be a godly man who makes an impact. Choose this day to be a godly woman who makes an impact.